Rose Meckley. Hello. Um, my name is Rose. I'm going to start with uh, a poem. I'm a spoken word artist, a uh, little history about spoken word poetry. Um, it's kind of an array of things. It's inspired by the beatniks. It's inspired by the Harlem, Harlem Renaissance. It's inspired by um, hip hop. So um, I'm, I will perform a poem. <clears throat> One in a million. That's how many people have your reading disability, Roseanne. One in a million. That's what the well-paid doctor told me. But don't worry, he said, you're not alone. <laughs> One in a million, and I'm not alone. That makes as much sense as this mumble-jumble shit they call an alphabet. A-E-I-O-U-N, sometimes Y. See, I didn't know these letters were special, and that these letters were going to make me special. I can't recognize vowels, and those little perks like to play word games, up, down, left, right, vertical across the page, like chess pieces in a never-ending board game. See, I don't know what you learned, but I learned E came before I. If it didn't, then they should have rearranged the alphabet as I, E, F, G, T, Q, R, S, 7, 9, ah, screw it. You got me memorizing thing like it's worth it. I think spelling all together is preposterous. Preposterous, P-O-S-T-E-Z-R-N, preposterous. Okay, so my spelling's a little off, but have you ever studied English spelling? Take the word drunkenness. D-R-U-N-K-E-N-N-E-S-S. -N -N -E -S -S. A drunk came up with the spelling. I know this because A, there's not enough thought put into it, and B, there's too many N's, and while drunks never know when to end, there's an L in salmon. Why the hell is there an L in salmon? Now you got my ears rubbing riverbeds trying to hear that L in salmon. And all I'm doing is hitting walls. And all I got to say for it is, damn, A-E-I-O-U. And sometimes I ask myself, why? See, bullies used to hold books over my head yelling, spell it, Rose. Spell it and you'll get it. I was put in exile for even going near a library. First, I blamed it on my pencil. It seemed to be holding everyone else's words just fine. I cursed each one I picked up. Spelling wrong again and again and again, till the paper was nothing but pink marks and my eraser had crumbled down like a watered-down tumbleweed. See the brain? It's like a windowsill. Outside, stage left, there's an apple tree. Replace those apples with letters. And when someone approaches you and asks you to spell something, you can grab outside your window, grab the letters necessary, and look, you have the word predictable. Well, aren't you so smart? See, my window is a lot smaller than others and really dirty. And my apple tree is kind of dying and wilted in the distance. So when I do reach for letters, I bring up nothing but sawdust and paint chips. So do it. Prick me again with one of those insults and pour lemon juice in my wounds. Let me shrivel up like that slug used to torture on boring summer days. And when September comes, I am nothing but a ghost writer writing in invisible ink. See, my writing was fine. The spelling was being held against me. I had great placements for nouns and adverbs, can embrace a beautiful, elegant adjective with ease. I fill up with tears at the side of a spelling bee. And this is my apology. To anyone who says I can't be a poet, because I don't know how to spell. Well, guess what? You're wrong. Because not only do I write, I also spit. And I spit nothing but fire, so call yourselves cremated. Yes, I have my obstacles. A-E-I-O-U and sometimes Y. But as you can see, they haven't stopped me yet. Thank you. Thank you. So I get personal in my poetry. Uh, so I have a very rare form of dyslexia. Um, a lot of people, when they hear that word, they assume, oh, you see numbers backwards or you see letters backwards. Um, and the thing about um, being dyslexic is that it's a wide range of things. Um, mine has, of course, a title that I cannot pronounce, nor can I spell. Um, so I just say, I'm dyslexic. Um, my form is very rare in the sense that I have a difficult time for my mouth and brain to connect when I see a vowel. And it's like, you know, I don't know the difference between a long A and a long E. And it wasn't until I was 13 years old did I even know what a vowel was. I was like, they're letters. What's so special about these ones? So it was very difficult for me to learn and to communicate with my peers. So I, of course, was a troubled child. 
I hated school. Um, I never really went to class. I found it really difficult to like communicate and express how I felt. So in seventh grade, um, my beloved language arts teacher came to me and said, Rose, I'm going to send you on a field trip. And I thought, oh, I get to skip school on a field trip. Of course I'm going to go. So I go to this field trip at Seattle Center. And it was a field trip about all these great organizations in Seattle for youth. There was an outdoor club. There was something for the YMCA. There was an organization for kids to help at soup kitchens. It was all these great array of things. I, of course, was not amused by any of them because I was an angsty 13-year-old girl. And I was like, I'm not going to do any of this. So during one of the lunch period time, we had free pizza. So we're sitting there, and we're enjoying our free pizza. And all of a sudden, this beautiful girl steps on. She goes, OK, we're going to have a poetry slam. Does anyone know what a poetry slam is? No one raises their hand in the lunch table. She goes, OK, a poetry slam is where a poet or an individual comes on stage and presents their own personal work. You have a time limit of three minutes and a 10-second grace period. And then you're judged by five random individuals in the audience on an Olympic scale of zero to 10. She goes, we're going to have a small little poetry slam. I, of course, am not interested. Then she gets up on stage, and I still remember it to this day, jumps on the table where we're eating our lunch and recites this beautiful, gorgeous poem about how she is not like every other girl, that she's not going to listen to the cover stories, and she's not going to listen to the magazines telling her to be skinny or be this or be that. And that there I was, completely like, damn, she's telling me like it is. And I've never had been smacked like that in my entire life. And it was this organization called You Speak Seattle. And I went up to the girl and I said, I'm completely moved. Like, you were an amazing poet. Like, I could never do that. She goes, that's a lie. You're only stopping yourself. Because when you're writing, you're the person stopping yourself from the truth. There is no one else telling you. You are the one moving the pen. And I, of course, in the back of my head was like, well, this girl doesn't know that I write in chicken scratch. None of my words have vowels in them. This doesn't make sense. She said, no, that's fine. You recite it. No one will see your words unless you want them to. So, of course, she gives me a flyer, says there's going to be a poetry slam. I go to the poetry slam, and I'm up there. My poor mother is in, I, my poor mother is in the back, and she's like, I'm going to vomit, I'm going to vomit, I'm going to vomit. She was so nervous for me, and here I am. I had this piece of paper, and I'm shaking, you know, and I'm reading this poem. It was a very, very, it's really hard to be me type poem, and I read it, and then I get off stage, and there are my peers cheering me on snapping their fingers, pounding their chests, giving their moan of sympathy. It was such a beautiful, moving thing. And I show the poem to my mentor, who was the one that introduced me, Angela Day. She saw it, and she goes, you are so special for being able to read this, because no one else can. <laughs> and that's how it was for me, is that I realized this was a form of expression that I wasn't being judged by anyone but myself. So I want you guys to think right now, just randomly, I want you to think of something that kind of makes you different, something that kind of sets you apart from everyone else, something you either probably were made fun of or you have to like hide. It could be physical, it could be a mental thing, it could be whatever. I just want you to think about that, okay? Um, another thing that I learned to do was express myself through film. And I got to the opportunity to go to this an amazing program called Real Girls. Where are my real girls at? You guys are not shy, come on. And I got to do the program and express myself in a whole different light. And I made a short film. Um, and with the help of Real Girls, they helped me produce it. And other former Real Girls helped. And so we're going to have show the film. So I guess I just point. Yes, here it is. Some people are destined for greatness, and others are not. Hopefully today, we will be better. <clears throat> Isis, this is your abnormal brain. Isis, come on, you spelled alphabet with an I. Which means your brain cannot fully function as normal people's brains are. Listen, pay attention in class more. It's disconnected, discombobulated, and complex. But what is grandma gonna say? In your classes, you are not capable of doing all the work. If you didn't spend so much time on your art, then maybe you'd have a good grade in English class. I highly recommend medication for your problem, if you understand what I'm saying. Maybe like an A or a B. <sighs> of course you don't. Hello? Yeah, 
I heard. Of course I heard. How couldn't I have heard? Why is it every time that I say this, it gets out? Oh my god. How, how could anyone say that? I listen to all their problems. How should I do my makeup? How should I do my hair? Why can't they just live how I tell them to? Remember? Yeah. What? Yeah. Isis! Isis, wake up! See, the normal brain is like a window, big and wide and clear. Outside the window, there's an apple tree. Replace the apples with letters, and when someone asks you to spell something, you can reach out to the tree and pick the letters needed. See, my brain, or window, is a lot smaller and a lot dirtier. And my apple tree is kind of dying and wilted. Sometimes I can't reach the letters. And other times, the letters are too big to pull through the window. And when they finally get pulled through, they're hard to read. The hardest letters to pull out are A, E, I, O, U. And sometimes Y, but only sometimes. So yeah, this was the, the, the film that I had um, a great opportunity to make with my fellow real girls. Um, and I realized that it was another way that no one had to see my spelling. Um, it was another way to express myself and not use my disability or my dyslexia as a crutch or an excuse. So I asked you guys to think of something that sets you apart, okay? What I want you to do, your kind of like homework assignment, is um, I want you to go home and make something that I call a pinky list. Wait, so the list of things that make you kind of quirky and weird from everyone else, right? So the top of my, mine is I don't recognize vowels. Another one is I have a fear of bananas. I don't know why, I just don't like them. Um, my socks never match. Um, I own gold shoes. So it was this kind of thing that this pinky list let me say that I'm, you know, okay, I might be different, but so is everyone else. Maybe there's something on my list that's on your list. Maybe there's something that you don't, maybe you don't have a fear of bananas. But either way, that's not something I'm going to use as an excuse. So that's what I've kind of learned. Um, I'm going to close out um, with one more poem. Um, since this is a TED Talk for women, because women rock. Yeah, I said it. Um, this is a poem inspired by one of my favorite women in literature. Um, this poem is called A Woman's Will. <clears throat> You want to divorce me. You wish to divorce me. <laughs> you silly crow, wingspan too short of raven, you foolish king. If it was not for me, you would have no hunger for demise and conquer, crave the flesh of another. I, your lady, no chambermaid, rest the sure and barren bed for you, sit waiting past midnight's croning moan. Your robes washed daily by these hands. Stone, cold water, rinse. Make absence of any bloodshed. I, your wife, clean up all your messes. You play no judgment on such rash decisions as these. No grounds are made for your ruling on such pressing matters as this. Divorce? 
You have one or two five, my dear. Coward, I'm calling you nothing but coward. Hollow, no backbone to aspire. Where will you go, sire? <laughs> oh, Macbeth, such childish quarrels as these push us back in our demand. Who will shine your blade? Iron the wrinkles out of the half-hearted strategy. It is the queen who makes all the moves. My scenarios unravel like chess, and you are just a pawn. Oh, my worship, you are just a wooden pawn. Names of former lovers hang over the mantelpiece that is my heart. Men not worthy of royals, you are lucky not to be sacrificed. I saw splint in your potential, spark in the sense of you being my lord. I know the women here back their husbands are victim to naive and godsmack, but I, I play shadow. I am stitched closely to your heels because I, Lady Macbeth, make every dagger a happy one. You may risk the tattling of the morning's light, fold that night sky into your fist, but it is I who planted the seed that will grow into our kingdom. You will be king of Scotland, feast, thrones, and rubies, and I, will be singed tightly by your side. Bash the ridiculous notion of failure. One must steal if one is not given. I vow no sleep will be lost over this. And I know from experience, all blood can easily be washed away. Thank you so much. <laughs>